I've never been pushed to my absolute max. Nobody's pulled me off of a stage and here I was, I'm actually completely taxed out and I can't go on. That's the best. This is Evan Carmichael. You, of course, know him from YouTube because his channels collectively have like close to 4 million subscribers and over a billion views. He's the guy who puts out the wildly successful top 10 rules to success. And he's also the guy who's shared the stage with the likes of David Goggins and Peyton Manning and Ed Milet and Tony Robbins and Dean Graziosi and Lewis Howes and so many more names. But all that aside, and most importantly, he's been my friend for close to 15 years. I told myself I couldn't write this book in eight weeks and I wrote it in five days. So I have this perceived max and I have my actual max. That's the game that we're playing. That's the we do hard things, getting past our perceived max and getting as close as we can to our actual max. Every now and then to be able to push yourself, to remind yourself of what you're actually capable of, what it does is helps you realize that the things that you think are your problems right now are actually nowhere close to what you should be dealing with and struggling with. All of the voices in your head of why you can't do something are not actually that big a deal if you just start, like remember who you are and go create some momentum. But I had a quick question, why momentum? I don't know. Um, I was doing an Instagram Lives with Kira Polson, who now I'm a business partner with and launched a publishing company together. And I met her at an event in Arizona. And she said she's a book medium. So she helps right. channel your books. You connect to God, you pray together, you call in your angels, and, and you find out your next book. That is so unlike you. I mean, it's like you to just say yes and do weird things. But it's so unlike you to uh, go through a process like that. I don't, I, I actually don't mind. Like I can fit into almost any, like I sent you a prayer, like let's pray from our, Oh, that was a fire prayer. It's a fire prayer. For me, it's just a different language. And I want people to gain momentum back to the title of the book. And I want people to get results and I, I want to help unblock, you know, like at the end of the day, it's still about belief. How do you get more belief? And what I found is an easy way to get them to act is to speak their language. So I'm happy to play with spirituality and God and past lives and talking about how your ancestors are talking through you and whatever, let's go. And, and I've, you know, rocks and like obsidian heals wounds or whatever. Like I, I'm, I'm down for all of it. And I'm also happy to play in the pure, this is all pattern recognition and it's all science and data. And you're only doing this because you've seen it happen. Cool. Like I could play in both fields equally. I just want to help people believe in themselves more. And I find to do that, you have to learn how to speak their language. So I met Kira at this event in, in Arizona and she said she's a book medium. And I didn't understand what that meant. And I had no intention of writing the book either, but I loved her energy. I loved her spirit. I love her vibe. Like she's an amazing human and I like collecting good people, right? One of my <laughs> evanisms is collect good people. Really so is. she was brand new in starting this. And I said, Hey, why don't we, why don't we do an Instagram live together? And you can walk me through, like you can, you can channel with me. And she has you, like you have a scent, you got to rub your hands with this orange thing and smell it and call in your angels. And my angel is Matthew McConaughey. He's what came into me, which is awesome. And I had no intention of writing the book. Hold on, hold on. What does that mean? <laughs> your angel oh, is Matthew. Know. I mean, I know you interviewed him for his book and stuff. How is Matthew McConaughey your angel? Matt, this is this. We do hard things. Just took a serious turn. I love it. I don't know, dude. I don't know. It's like I'm following her process. This is her process. So uh, I don't have it written down anymore. She like gave me this PowerPoint or this this printout where like step one is you uh, you have some kind of scent, some kind of smell, and she gave it to me like this orange thing. Step two is you you imagine that you're being cleansed and that you like white light is going all over you. Yeah, you want to you want to jump in. Look like you want to say something. No, you just I'm, I'm, nodding. Okay, I'm cool. just like, I'm on along for the ride. So I'm, I, I'm along for the ride. This is it. Like, I don't do this normally, but I'm along for the ride. Now, now because we're doing an Instagram live, like, bless my mouth so I can speak truth. Cool. So I'm imagining the white light coming on my mouth so I can speak truth. Awesome. Next, you're going to call in your angels. So she believes that, like, there's angels who protect you and guide you. And this is part of her process. So like, okay, call in your angels. Like, okay, I'm going to call in my angels. And for her, it's like Joan of Arc and whoever. And uh, Matthew McConaughey comes to mind for me. I don't know. It's like, who's coming to mind for you? Matthew McConaughey. All right, cool. Trust in the process. So go with Matthew McConaughey. And okay, Matthew wants you to write a book. Okay. At this time, I have no intention to write a book. Like built the service, my book. My agent wants me to have a new book. 
like my agent's going to be pissed if I'm now writing a new book without I've going to you, the I've asked you behind the scenes for like, for like years, like what's the next book? What's the next book? What's the next thing? And you're like, I just built to serve as it. I love it. Like built to serve as the book. Yeah. Built to serve as the book. So I had no intention of writing the book, zero. But but I loved Kira's energy. I wanted to bring her on to the show and let her at least show what she did. And I didn't think I'd have a book by the end of it. But then she's like, okay, Matthew's whispering to you. I forget exactly. You can go watch the video. But, you know, Matthew's telling me the name of the book. And he's like, Momentum. Why Momentum? Back to your question. I don't know. I don't know, dude. I don't know. I'm not overthinking it. I'm just, this is how you create speed. Like when you overthink it, then nothing happens. Why Matthew McConaughey? Why Momentum? I have no idea. But that's what came through. So he said, okay, I'm going to follow this. Now with a book like Momentum, like my first book, Year One Word, took me a year to write. Momentum I wrote in five days. And she asked me, you know, when are you going to start writing this book? Like, well, it's called Momentum. What, when am I, like, I can't say I'm going to start writing this. Yeah, in a year. Uh, I'll, I'll start. <laughs> right? That's the kind of answer. So I guess I have to start today. And she initially challenged me to write it in eight weeks. Why eight weeks? I don't know. That's what came to mind. Cool. But I wrote it in five days and we had it published in eight weeks with all the graphics and color and like art and cover design and copy editing and all that, which is an insane timeline, but it was up in eight weeks. And um, a lot of the, like I had no script. I just started writing, Mark. Like it was an Instagram live. We finished and I just started writing whatever came to my mind. And there's the voices that like, I don't have time for this. I have 42 people on my team. I have other projects. Like, when am I going to do this? I'm, I'm building a software company. I've got my YouTube channel. We just hired a bunch of people. I'm trying to train them on how to... And, okay, cool. I am going to write the you book. Also, so we'll see what you also are a part of like, I don't know how many companies now, but like in your group of companies, there's like five, six companies. Like how many companies are you part of? And then you even just mentioned that you started a publishing company with her. So it's like, when do you have time to write a book? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't. And... and Honestly, if you look at it too, on day, I forget what day it was though, um, you know, Nina discovers a lump in her chest. And so we tell the story in the book. So the book is me sharing my evanisms, but also life, documents right? me writing the book and how many words I wrote on each day and when my timestamps are and how I didn't think I'd have time to do it and found time, right? On day three or whatever, uh, Nina discovers a lump in her chest. And that was how we like woke up. Like I'm hugging her in the morning. She's sitting on my lap. I hug and I, I, have uh my chin goes into into her like upper chest and she's like how that really hurts and then she pushed on herself like wow this really hurts oh there's something here and immediately it's like what is happening this is like everything the whole day got canceled and like we have to go see a doctor we have to go get tests we have to and um that was the first day i thought like the book was not even on my mind anymore right it's like let's just the book, the business, nothing else mattered. Like, let's go see what's happening with Nina. And we go and see the doctor and finally get an appointment in a walk-in clinic because, you know, it's the only place to go. And uh, he gave us some reassuring news, but we still weren't 100% clear. And we lined up the tests, like basically did everything we could. And when we got home, I forget what time it was, like exhausted, the whole day of just stress and anxiety, everything behind. And it's like, Nina's like, hey, okay, well, what else do you want to do? you want to relax? Do you want to show? Like, wh- what do you want to do? And she said, go write your book. <laughs> <laughs> well, what? I, like, you, part of what I actually loved about this is like this little hidden Easter egg, right? In the first few pages, there's all of these names, all of these names, Gary Vanderchuk, Tony Robbins, Brennan Bouchard, Les Brown, Grant Cardone, Marie Folio. James Altucher, like just name after name, after name, after name, after name of people who are just raving about how awesome you are, Evan. Evan, you're so awesome. And then, <laughs> and then there's one from Nina, which I love, which is Evan does a lot of great things, but behind every great man is an even greater woman. <laughs> I love Listen, that. It doesn't happen without Nina. None of this stuff happens, does not happen without Nina. As much as she's like not the face of the company, but not just behind the scenes, but even just to support. Like she joined my company a couple of years ago. But even before that, just having someone to support you and chew you on and not judge you. And Nina's not giving me entrepreneurial advice, but just the, the support and cheerleader and having somebody in your corner, I think means a lot, you know, when you're trying to start something new. Um, so a lot of my success is due to the relationship with Nina, which then also is like if she has something in her chest that uh, that's like, devastating that was a rough 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 day um and who knows where it could have gone but um it's crazy because when we're in the middle of projects like this stuff happens you know 
Like we have all of these voices say we can't do it. And I outlined some of them at the beginning of the book of all the reasons why I can't write a book. Cool. I'm going to go do it. And then, and then stuff happens. Life happens. You know, I got to take me to the hospital and how do you then show up? And I was okay with not continuing the book at that point. Like if you're going to stop something, you have to be proud of the reason why. I don't know if that evanism is in the book. It might be. If you're not going to follow through on something, you have to be proud of the reason why. So for me, being tired, I'm not proud of the reason for not doing it. But Nina not feeling well, Nina having a lump in her chest, I'm okay with that. Like I'm, I'm okay with now giving up on my book to go do that thing. I love that. I was, I was doing this uh, challenge uh, in the month of August at my gym. It was called Marathon Month. And I wanted to get better at running, but I'm not really much of a runner. But uh, the challenge was to see who in the whole gym could run the furthest in a month, but not outside of class. And you can only show up at one class. It's only 23 minutes per day maximum. And so I go to the gym five days a week and I figure, okay, I'm, I'm going to crush this and win. Most people go two, three days. But like on day six, I'd taken a recovery day and I looked at the stats and I realized that this amazing woman who I later found out was like this, she's older than me. Uh, she's a marathon runner. She's from Boston Marathon. She came in every single day. So she's now like two and a half miles ahead of me. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to come in Saturday. She comes in Saturday. I come in Sunday. She comes in Sunday. I come in Monday. She comes in Monday. So I'm still two and a half miles behind. And I finally find her. I track her down and I go, are you going to take a day off? She said, when the month is over, I'm coming in every day. And then I was like, oh no, now I have to run every single day because she's running every single day. And I have to try and make up two and a half miles on her when, when she's a good runner and I'm only eking a little bit away. Flash forward 15 days later, I'm able to pass her. And in the last few days, I'm like, I'm going to win, I'm going to win, I'm going to win, I'm going to win. And then I hurt my back because I was running so much and I couldn't even walk. And so I stumble into the gym, like, because I have to show up every day, but I can't run as fast as she can run. I can only like barely jog. And even then, it was like my legs were going numb. Um, it hurts so much. It was like sucking the wind out of me. And she passed me and she caught up and passed me. But in that moment, I thought of you because in that moment, I was like, I was like, I would be proud to lose to her right now. Because I could have just been like, I need a week of recovery. Yeah, like, but I still showed up and stumbled my way through it. And so at that point, it wasn't about me winning anymore. I was like, win, lose, whatever. I don't care. Like, Just the fact that I'm showing up every single day, even when I probably shouldn't. And most people thought it was stupid for me to, to still keep running anyway. Uh, in the end, I did win, which made me even more proud. But yeah, I thought of you. Do the things. You talk about, we do hard things. It's doing the things because you said you were going to do it no matter how hard it becomes, unless you're really proud of the reason why, right? So for me, if I was doing that, I'm not as motivated by beating somebody else or winning the award. It's more that I said I was going to show up and so I'm going to do it. And so even if it was on the lowest speed or I'm crawling or I'm hopping on one leg, even though that seems crazy to other people, that's where your self-confidence comes from. That's where your self-belief comes from is that I was not going to do it Everybody would have given me the pass. Everybody with lower standards than you would have taken it off. And you want to take it off. And you're going to say, you know what? I'm going to, I'm just going to show up and do it. And you walk out feeling amazing. Like I just did that. You know, when I broke my neck and I went live, because I said I was going to go live every day on my tour, it felt awesome. I didn't even know what I said. I had a concussion. My neck was broken in two spots, but I still went live from the hospital because I said I was going to go live. Was it my best stuff? No, but the self-confidence that came from that and credit to you for suggesting that I even keep my, my neck. You were going to throw them out. And I was, I like, was going to throw was them like, out. You can't, I'm, you can't throw I'm not, them out. I'm not a sentimental guy, but, but Mark, this. I'm super sentimental. So this, yeah, <laughs> Mark's got junk everywhere. But this one I wore for almost 60 days and it's got like duct tape on it because it was breaking. Uh, Nina signed it. I love you. Get well soon. Heart Nina. And so like I wore this except for a few minutes a day where I could have a shower. So you're sleeping in it, everything. And you, you can't move your neck. And that one I got just in like the final few days. And uh, I I would not have kept this and lust for marks and you're going to throw that away. What are you talking about? So uh, there are very few sentimental things, but I kept this because I, I look at this and it's a reminder of, I can't believe I did that. Even me looking back, I can't believe that I did Honestly, that. I even forgot that you broke your neck until you just met, like, I, I know you did it and I know it's part of your story and whatnot, but 
but it was not only a really scary thing, and we have an earlier episode where we really dig into it, but it was like, I would say, it's pretty crazy that you kept going with your 23 city tour, that you kept going, that you kept doing it, that you showed up, that you still made videos. I saw you in Cleveland on your last day and you were in so much pain, you had to lie down on the floor while you're giving, like, like you're giving a talk and you have to like lie down with the microphone. Like, dude, man, you're hardcore. Well, I think that's what we all want to be, you know, like we don't want to accept excuses for why we're not showing up. And there is a point where you quit, you know, of course, like I'm not going to beat myself into death. But that line, one of the things I talk about in momentum is like move the brake line forward, like where you would normally break, just move a little bit forward, just a little bit past where you would normally break. That's it. Not like go kill yourself, but a little bit forward. And so the tour, I didn't know if I would continue the tour or not because because I broke my neck and I definitely was not as good. So to your point about, hey, you hurt your back. Now you're not running as fast. When I was doing the rest of my tour, I definitely was not as good as I was a week earlier when I could move around. I'm, I'm sitting at the front of these places with ice packs on and four pillows behind me like I can't move my neck and I'm just sitting there for four hours talking. But I wasn't as good as as I was before. But one, people were more inspired by that, that I would even show up, then my motivational whatever talk was happening before. So they're even more inspired by it. So the result is actually getting better because of the impact you're having. But even more important for me is that the default shouldn't be to just quit. Everybody said quit. My my family said quit. My my agent said quit. My team said quit. Like everybody said quit. And it was just assumed that I would go home. Like, okay, well, when are you coming home? You can't get on an airplane because you broke your neck. So they won't let you fly. So like, what's the fastest way home and how soon can you get there? It's like, whoa, 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 like, I don't want to just default to assuming that we quit. How about, I didn't know that I would continue and finish the tour. It's a whole other month, but let's just hit Kansas City. You know, let's just hit Minnesota. Let's just like, let's, let's just go to the next one and see. As opposed to by default saying, no, I'm out, stop, done. And it's surprising how far you can go if you just keep, the momentum going. Like you hurt your back. You could have quit in the competition. You can't move. You can't run. And then you healed a little bit enough, I guess, to continue to run. And if you didn't, well, I would, I would that- go to the gym and I would do my 23 minutes because I was worried that they would pull me off the treadmill. I was worried they'd say, You're too hurt. You can't do this. So I'd have to like walk into the gym, like everything's fine, get it done. And then I spent every single other moment, waking moment in bed. <laughs> it was just like sole focus. My sole focus for a few days was just those 23 minutes on the treadmill each day. It was the most important thing in my life <laughs> for those few days. And I did heal and I was able to get back on it and, and get back to it. But, but that, um, like that's Mark at his best. In that you know broken neck, Evan, I look at that sometimes and say, uh, who is that guy? You know, like if you haven't been through anything hard in a while, like I can't believe I did that. That's crazy. Would Evan right now be able to do the same thing that Evan did back in 2019? you ask yourself that? What's that? Do you ask yourself that? Because I often go, I think of my health challenge. I think of the treadmill. I think of business. I think of successes I've had. And as soon as I think about it, even though I know I've done it and everyone goes, Mark, you've done it before. You can do it again. I just, I just don't know if I believe them. It's a great reminder. Like, and again, credit to you for encouraging me to keep it. Because sometimes you just walk into an office and it's there and you don't notice. And it's just part of the background. But then sometimes I look at it. It's like, I can't believe I did that. That's crazy. I'm, I'm badass. You know, it's like it's, it's you a are. great reminder. It's a great reminder because we don't live in those things constantly, but what they do is it raises your baseline. Right. Mm-hmm. So I might have gone to like I did that, I climbed this new peak and I'm hitting a, a way higher level, but I'm not there all the time. Once I recover and the tour is over and I I you need recovery days, but when I fall back down, I'm not falling to the same level as I was before. I've raised my baseline. And so even writing the book was another challenge of sorts. Well, I where find this interesting I, though, because because you, you hurt your neck years ago. Mm-hmm. And because of that, you weren't able to fly. Because you weren't able to fly, you took a trip to New York where you wrote one third of your previous book, right? Built, Built to Serve. Mm-hmm. And then when you get challenged with writing this new book and you go, oh, how could I possibly write something in eight weeks? You go, oh yeah, I wrote one third of my previous book just on a car ride to New York and back and if I could do that, I could probably do this. So it's like, so like, even there's this like through line where if you're able to remember these moments and these challenges and these things you've done, you're able to stack up and, and they're still serving you today. 
is why I think, honestly, the biggest thing people are missing is momentum. So this book probably could have been called any number of things. And it is a collection of my greatest hits or best evanisms or whatever over the years, which, you know, Mark might have been responsible for at least a quarter of them through our previous oh, episodes. easily more. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, let me go through. Let me go through. I've already, I've already highlighted the ones that I'm responsible for. Okay, yeah, a lot of my best moments came from yelling at Mark on our something approved podcast. So (laughs) there's a lot of great stuff in there. It might have been able to be called anything. It could have taken any of those things. One of the things that I often say is the only thing you're missing is momentum. So at the beginning, and what I love about the book is it doesn't just have the advice, but documents the journey of how did I write this book in five days. Because at the beginning, I'm starting overwhelmed, stressed out, not believing, not this thinking this is a waste of my time. And I have way bigger priorities that I need to focus on right now as an entrepreneur, as a CEO, as a leader, as a husband, as a father, than doing this thing right now. All of the common thoughts that we all have. And then I still get the book done in five days. Why? Well, because I started. Because I was just missing momentum. And that's where most people are stuck. Like they, they don't know how to take the first step. They're worried about being too perfect. And once you're in motion, you realize, oh, like that first step I took wasn't that bad. You know, like that actually wasn't that bad. Wow. I can, I can just keep going. And when you're in momentum and you keep going, amazing things can happen. And yeah. so, you know, even back to the top of why momentum and why have Kira on and why do channeling and, and that seems so outside of what you would normally do or whatever. It's like, but all of that overthinking of who... I have been or what I might be seen as that all strips away at momentum. Because what's the worst thing that happens? We do an IG live and I, nothing, I don't know. I got no book, but I'd still find some way to make it hopefully valuable for her. And now I've got the book. We've launched a publishing company, like amazing things happen just because of that. So I was thinking back because um, for for longtime listeners and whatnot, they know that I helped you shoot your first YouTube video. And you were doing this momentum challenge uh, last month. And you reminded me, like, again, I, I kind of forgot along the way, but you reminded me, hey, we shot, we shot your first YouTube video together. And if people go to your channel and they, they look up the videos and then reverse by date, you'll see it. It's the one we did on Disney. And you're young and I'm young. It was a long time ago, but we shot it in like early March. We talked about it in like January. We shot in early March. We released it in April, I think April 10th or something like that. So even that first video took, Weeks, like weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. But I was curious because I wanted to go back to my first YouTube video. And I remember this because if you go if on this channel that you're watching this on right now, if you go back and you reverse by date, you'll see that there's a video where it's called, I wanted my first video to be perfect, but instead it's this. And it's only like 30 seconds long or a minute long. It's me at your tour at your very first stop in Pittsburgh when you were releasing your book, Built to Serve, or I guess it was before that, right? It was before the Built to Serve was written. And I wanted, I knew I was launching this new YouTube channel. I wanted the first video to be amazing because I always thought in the future, I would be able to say, hey, if you go back, this is my first video. Like it was this awesome guest or it was this amazing conversation. It was this amazing thing. So I was waiting. Like I was waiting on... Wait, was that my... actually... I don't think so. Was that actually... Could you imagine how... So that was three years ago? Hold on. I, I'm, were... I, I'm about to play a clip for you. Uh, it's, it, was, it was January 12th, 2019. Let, let me play the clip for you. Hold on. I don't actually know what to talk about because I didn't think about it, but it doesn't have to be good. It just has to be real. It has to be done. I have to build momentum did one, and it has to happen now. Momentum, momentum, let's go. I don't know what I said, but I heard you me said, saying something. You said momentum, 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 let's go. Oh, yeah, okay, <laughs> good, there it is. But here's the thing. So uh, like, I wanna, I wanna dive into where you wanna take it, but I wanna take you somewhere first. Were you actually thinking in 10 years, Yeah. Mark in 2029 is gonna look back and say, episode one, I had this yeah. guest? Yeah. Yeah, I was planning it. I was planning it to be perfect. Perfect, 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 right? I, I, again, I know that Letterman on his very first episode had a very first guest and, on his, and it was um, Bill Murray. And on his very last episode, guess who came back? Bill Murray, right? Like it was, it's this tradition or this thing of like, I wanted to be able to go back. Like, I, I don't even know if it was you or who I planned to have on, but I wanted someone spectacular. So that way my very first video could be awesome and could be amazing and could be perfect. And I could always look back and go, 
hey, here's a small piece of trivia. Did you know that you were my like, and and I was I was sitting on it for like weeks. And then I'm at your event and you're like, post, you have to post, you have to post. And I was mad at you because you were going to ruin my plan. <laughs> so instead I went to the back of the room and I was like, Ugh, you're, you're ruining everything, Evan, by making me do something that I don't want to do. But guess what? It went up. <laughs> so I agree that I think, I think most people want the first thing to be perfect. I mean, me too, I, me. Me, I actually showed that video today in my Movement Makers training to, we were talking YouTube editing hacks as a topic and, and we showed that video and we talked about it. It's like, don't be me. I had my friend Mark come <laughs> in and we filmed the whole day and his video is only six minutes and it would, like half of it was B-roll anyway, me not even being on camera and I got the suit and the tie and the background light in the perfect position and all of this stuff. But I think most people want the first thing to be perfect, not because they're thinking 10 years down the line, I want to look back and I want to be so proud of myself, but because they're afraid of being judged by the people who are going to see it and it's not going to be good enough. I think if you actually ask people to be reflective and imagine 2029, you looking back on 2019, you, you'd much rather see that it wasn't perfect and you see the growth and that, wow, look how far I've come. Because if you logically talk people through that, that becomes a much more that's a much better story. You yeah. coming on and sucking and that you stayed with it and kept going is a way better story than you were perfect out of the gate because nobody's going to be able to really feel like they're connected to you if you were perfect from your first one. But the bigger fear of the perfectionism on the first video or the first whatever is that it's going to suck. Therefore, you feel like you suck and then other people will judge you for being so bad. I don't think most people are looking like 10 years mm -hmm. down the line. I think they're too caught up in the moment as opposed to if you had perspective, it would actually help you get momentum. Yeah, see, I, I struggle from like most of us, right? Like I, I have high standards and I want everything to be really, really good. But the other thing I struggle with, which is I think what was holding me up and still holds me up is I don't want to waste the gold when there's no one watching, right? Like, it's this idea of like, well, when my audience gets big enough and when my business gets big enough and when this gets big enough, then I'm going to go ahead and give the really good stuff. But I don't want to waste the amazing stuff when no one's watching. And that's something that, that I realized uh, maybe about a year ago is like, oh, if you want the audience and if you want the growth and if you want all those things, you, you have to speak and, 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 and put the effort in as if the audience and the growth and all those things are already there. Because to your point, you're still going to suck at it and learn as you go anyway, right? Yeah. And, and it's like, here's the thing. High standards, we're using that as a as praise. But the reality is, if you're struggling with that, you have high standards for the work, the output, but low standards for yourself. What because if you, actually had, if you had high standards for yourself, then you wouldn't be so attached to something sucking at the beginning. I don't you follow. have high standards for the work. You have high standards for like, I want this to look a certain way. Yeah. Because but if you have high standards me. for yourself, then you start to value the effort that you're putting in and realizing that you win by going to the gym and by mm. lifting five pounds mm. and then seven pounds and 10 pounds. So we wear that as a badge of honor. If I have high standard, no, you don't. You have low standards. You have low personal standards. You just have high standards for your output because there's low standards for yourself. It's a self-confidence problem. Another thing to challenge me for me to roll around. <laughs> this is why it's, I not that, to it's not that dissimilar than like the whole idea. We, we got into this, I think it was even on Instagram live. I was it driving was. through the, the <laughs> Texas. I was driving through Texas and we were talking about tying yourself worth to your effort, not the results. I'm like, you couldn't get it. And I, Effort I think got increasingly frustrated and angry. <laughs> you did. And it inspired you to say like, hey, if, if yelling at Mark is this much fun, imagine if we could do it weekly. And that's there why we go. started the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Like tie yourself worth to the effort, not the results. Like you got the best. It's great that you, you beat her, the woman in the running competition. But the best boost your self-confidence was not quitting when your back was hurting. And yeah. then still showing up the next day. Like that's the thing that actually reward. And and maybe it gets worse. Like again, maybe you're limping or walking or crawling. I, I can't even explain how painful this was because it was like, I have a bad glute because I run so much, but then it went to my back, but then it went to my sciatica. 
And like, I couldn't sleep. I mean, I mean, I'm not going to say it's worse than you breaking your neck, but um, I couldn't sleep. I struggled to breathe um, because it was just like, it was so painful. I took my dog for a walk and, and a really short walk, like something that would only take me 15 minutes, took me about half an hour. But then I was so far away from home that I couldn't get back. I had to like lay down yeah. and then slowly make my way back. And there was a moment where I was like, I don't even know if I can make it home right now. And my dog's like looking at me like, let's go, Mark. <laughs> like, What's happening here? And I'm like, I was like, I think I'm stuck. <laughs> I have to call my wife to come pick me. I still made it home. But it took me an hour and 15 minutes to do a 15 minute walk. <laughs> but here's the thing. Maybe you don't make it home, right? Like the, I still made it home is still the result. Maybe you don't make it home. Like the best moment in, in the whole tour was the first stop. We canceled Denver because I, I was in the hospital when I was supposed to do the, the speaking gig. And I asked the doctor, okay, well, like release me back to my place and I'll do, I'll do it for at, out of my bed at the Airbnb. Like, let's go. Whoever wants to come over, I'll just, he's like, no, 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 you're not doing that. <laughs> it's like, this is how concussions work. Let me educate you. But the next stop was Kansas City. And we refunded, I don't know, I mean, you probably know, sir, I don't think I told in the book, but we refunded everybody the money for being there because I knew I wasn't going to go for three, four hours like I normally would. And then we messaged everybody and said, uh, I'm going to still show up. I, I booked the hotel room. I'm not getting my money back on that. You guys all book time off and your calendar to be here. So I'm still going to show up. And I'll go for as long as I can go, but it's not going to be the full thing. And, and here's already the refund for your tickets. And we still had, I don't know, 40 people, 50 people show up. And, and I wasn't great. And Nina had to pull me off. Because you were so going to keep going. <laughs> what? Because you were going to keep going. going. I would have gone until I passed out. And Nina was looking at my lips. Because when it got too dry, she was going to pull me off. And so... After about an hour, I could notice my lips were like getting really dry. And so, yeah, I started licking my lips a lot and drink a lot of water. So she couldn't tell. And it bought me an extra half an hour. <laughs> and then she, after an hour and a half, normally be like three or four hours, she pulled me off. She's like, she actually, she said, guys, we have to stop this. I wasn't like about to pass out, but I was, uh, you know, it wasn't my not, best. But you're, but you're not superhuman and you're not no, no. special and you're not built differently than everyone else. So what is it that makes you capable of doing these things? I think everybody's capable of doing these things. It's just deciding that you are going to do these things. It's just like the break line is moving a little bit forward each time. Like you may not be able to do that, but your version of that may be very different. Your version of that may be having a conversation with your wife. Your version of that may be writing the first page of your book. Like this, we all have our own version of that. But that moment when she pulled me off and she canceled the Kansas City event was the best moment of the whole thing. It's like, I've never been pushed to my absolute max. And then nobody's ever canceled. Like nobody's pulled me off of a stage. Nobody like in the middle of something, nobody's ever done that. And here I was, I'm, I'm actually completely taxed out and I can't go on. That's the best. Like that I hit my max because we quit before we hit our max and we quit way before we hit our max, right? I told myself I couldn't write this book in eight weeks and I wrote it in five days. So I have this perceived max and I have my actual max. And we, that's the game that we're playing. That's the we do hard things, getting past our perceived max and getting as close as we can to our actual max. And so I hit my actual max for the maybe the first time in my whole life. I hit my actual max. So that was the greatest moment. So if you're out walking your dog and running whatever, and then like you have to call your wife because you cannot come back. I think that's the best, like, it's stupid. Logically, it's for anybody listening, <laughs> you know, the hardcore people get it. And like, this is great. The newbies may be like, what did this sound so, when is it like when you're trying to hurt yourself? Or what's that word? Uh, I, I, I don't know, I know what you're saying. Though. It's like, yeah. it's, it's like, it's like, this is not healthy. And logically, it's not. And physically, it's not. Like, it's not good for my body to do that. But mentally, in self worth e it's the best and so the whole treadmill thing that you're doing i would have done the same thing like i would have i would have faked it and like fit, pretend that i was okay and like go and start doing it but if you get to the point where you can't i would have still gone i would have walked i would have crawled i would have gone and crawled 
on the treadmill at whatever the slowest pace is just because, and if they say you're worried about, they might kick me out or like, cool. Like I am staying on this treadmill and you're going to have to call the police to escort me out of here. Right. And if they do that, then like, that's your max. Like you hit them out. Like that would be, if the police came and dragged you off of your knees off the treadmill to go out, it's like max. I had nothing left. I had everything I did. I tried my absolute max. It's not healthy for you. Your body's falling apart. Your knees are all bloody or whatever, but like you'll recover from those physical wounds, but the boost that it gives your self-confidence is incredible. And you hit a new peak and then you fall down to a new baseline because if you can do that, then of course you could write a book in eight weeks. Yeah. I um, I had this epiphany during that period um, because it was hurting so much, but I was so proud of myself. I've never really been in a situation where like I had to really, really change my gait and my run because it just hurt so much. And I could feel my legs going numb. <laughs> like I could feel them tingling and going numb and like all these things. Or when you get off and you go to take a step and your knees buckle under you because they just can't support your body weight and you kind of fall. So I was maybe pushing a little bit, but I had this realization that like pride can't be given. Confidence can't be given. And I had spent a lot of time in my life in, in work and in business even with my friendship with you, being proud because someone said something nice to me to make me feel proud or getting confidence because someone says something to me that boosts my confidence. And I realized in that moment that pride is earned and confidence is earned and it just can't be given. Um, And it comes down to the things we do. And so now I'm trying to figure out how to hold on to that and do that more, but it was a real breakthrough for me. Well, I mean, I mean, and like what a gift. And people can get that by listening to this show and subscribing. If you're not, go subscribe to the We Do Hard Things podcast. Give it a five-star review. Give them some love. Uh, And and conversations like this may help spur somebody to believe in themselves a little bit more to take on that next challenging project. And you will have these moments where you do something amazing and you hit a new high. And then again, you fall back down to the baseline. And then you're looking for the next opportunity. You're looking for the next challenge. You're looking for the next mountain to climb, the next chance to prove yourself, to remind yourself of who you are and what you're capable of, and hopefully hit a new peak. I had another one, actually, this year in Arizona, I was doing uh, Joe Polish, a friend of the channel, friend of mine now, uh, was doing, uh, I think it's called NAD, where they, they inject, they take your blood out, mix it with ozone and a bunch of, and then put it back into your body ozone and NAD and like put it back into your body. It's like, do you want to come with me? It's like, oh, I like, I have a weak stomach. I hate needles. How I broke my neck was I fainted. And you fainted and just by reading about it. Reading about <laughs> medical stuff, biohacks, and I passed out. But I want, so I thought, oh, I'll do it. I'll do it. And, you know, he's making it worse because I'm, I tell him I have a weak stomach. He's like, oh yeah. And like, he, he had his done first and his little blood. He's like, look at all this blood and like, well, <laughs> you know, making it worse. And I'm like, I'm like, I got You're like my, turning green. <laughs> oh yeah. I got, I got my head in my hands on my, you know, and then, so then it's my turn. Look, okay, here we go. And she starts pulling out the blood and I start to feel really weak and queasy. And then like, I gotta, I'm gonna, I gotta lie down. I gotta lie down. And, and I fainted again. Did you? It's like this. So I fainted on the bed. This is the second time I fainted since broke my neck and then here fainted. So the second time in my life that I fainted and nothing really even happened. Like she pulled out, she didn't do any of the mixing, injecting back. She was just pulling out like a quarter of the blood that she needed. (laughs) And I passed out. We know your weakness now. If anyone wants to (laughs) to kidnap you, just, just say gross things. (laughs) Yeah. She, I mean, I made it worse, but all the anticipation made it worse. Joe was playing into it. He made it worse. And if he knew that that was that bad, he wouldn't have done it. But, um, you know, I'm proud that I did it. I'm also very proud that I noticed it coming on because my fear after the first time was, what if I don't catch it and like fall again and faint and right? So I felt it coming and then I got to the bed and then I didn't know I was going to faint. It just felt a little weak. And again, like if you're doing that every week, that's a problem, you know, like I don't want to be fainting every week. That's not the, that's not the whole idea. And I don't want to be crawling on my knees and can't make it back from the home 
But every now and then to be able to push yourself, to remind yourself of what you're actually capable of, what it does is helps you realize that the things that you think are your problems right now are actually nowhere close to what you should be dealing with and struggling with. All of the voices in your head of why you can't do something are not actually that big a deal if you just start moving, like remember who you are and go create some momentum because you're capable. That's it, dude. I got excited there. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, when you were doing your momentum challenge, uh, I, I jumped in on it because you know anything that you're doing, I was like, okay, this is something I got to be a part of. But on day one, you asked everyone who was part of the challenge to uh, pick, I guess, what the one thing that we've been putting off for months or for years or even for decades. And, and in your book, you tell the story of, of a woman on, that you met at a conference who wanted to be a singer but hasn't written anything in decades. And so you challenged her, spent seven minutes writing a song. Mm -hmm. So she did. And then she realized it hit her that the last seven minutes, she had done more work, more effort, more progress on this dream she had been holding on to for 10 years or more. In the last seven minutes, she did more than she had done in the previous 10 years combined. And so when you did this challenge, for me, I was like thinking like, oh, you know, like there's a bunch of easy things I could pick. But with my anxiety um, that I that I have, and uh, you know, I've always been against pharmaceuticals, um, so I haven't pursued it with my doctor really. A year ago, during kind of COVID and pandemic, I set up an appointment with him to talk to him, but it was a call and it didn't line up and it didn't work. And so I was like, eh, I tried. I told my wife, I was like, well, I tried. I tried to call the doctor, and he didn't he didn't show up for the appointment. So there we go. But when you challenged all of us to pick something that we had been putting off for a long time. I was like, okay, I'm actually going to book an appointment with my, with my doctor. I'm actually going to get my files transferred from, from the counselor or the psychologist that I'd been seeing that had diagnosed me with GAD. I'm actually going to start to pursue this thing that I don't want to do, um, but I know I have to. And I did it. And it was like, it, it was um, a weight that was actually lifted on me. I mean, it's, it's now I, there's more things that I have to worry about, but rather than be this thing that I knew I should do and need to do and one day must do, and I know in my head that future me has this figured out, you forced me to make it today. Rather than me go like, well, I know that in five or 10 years, I've got this figured out, but I got like long, I don't have to do this today. I can do this tomorrow. I can do this tomorrow. And I can keep putting it off. You, by challenging me and challenging everyone in the group, you forced us to say like, today is the day that I'm going to do something. When we're not in a challenge, when, we're not, when we don't have Evan Carmichael saying, Mark, today is the day that you have to do something. How do we know that today is the day that we have to do the thing that we have to do? Well, it's not putting so much pressure that today has to be the day. But <laughs> okay. The, the, Maybe the I oversold things, that. <laughs> well, well, like here, the two things I would recommend is one, you, the more you can be around the people who are doing the thing, then the more likely you're going to follow through. So being part of challenges are great. Cool. L listen to this show. We've talked about it already, right? Like if you listen to Mark and it gets you inspired, cool. Mark's got tons of episodes to go back and listen to. Or if you hate Mark and you love David Goggins or Joe Rogan or Tony Robbins or whoever it is, like your parents, your family, you know, the people around you, they're not on the level that you're at and you're already the big fish in this small pond. So being around other bigger fish at the thing, because they pull you up to make you want to do better. We've all watched a YouTube video or listened to a podcast and left feeling like, man, I gotta, I gotta go do something. Right. We've I'm, I'm in this rut. I didn't even realize I was in a rut. I need to go make a change. So whatever inspired that inject that more into your environment so that it will happen naturally a lot more often. So you don't have to force and judge yourself for like, why is today not today? Um, the second thing is just small starts. And when you get an idea for something, you go do it. Just like Kira and the book, how this all came out and she's a book medium and I'm curious, I want to support her. And I, I don't think it's going to lead anywhere and I have no intention to write a book, but yeah, let's do it. Call on my angels. Awesome. Matthew McConaughey. We're going to breathe in orange essence all and we're right, going to go right, do this. All right. Thing. <laughs> right. It's like we overjudge the, the next step. You have an idea in your head, give it a shot. Like you won't know until you actually start doing it. And what ends up happening is similar to the story, the story you just shared. You don't know what the doctor is going to say and you don't know where it's going to lead. And so it's all of these what ifs as opposed to, okay, just 
make the appointment and and see what happens. So then you can make a right call afterwards. And maybe that means you go on medication, make a different path, or maybe it means something completely different. But until you go on, you start to try, you don't know. And so being in an environment where you are encouraged and it's probably not from the people in your life right now, like you don't have enough of it in your life right now. So you have to design an environment and a habit and bring in the people and the podcasts and the YouTube channels and the books that inspire you to want to make a difference. And then when you get ideas to teach yourself that you just do something to get started, to take it, it doesn't make sense. Cool. Channeling your book doesn't make sense for you. Awesome. But, but you gave it a shot. You're like, you're prejudging it way too much before you've actually even tried. I, um, I was back going back and listening to some past uh, clips from our podcast, something to prove that we used to do together. And the first part of your book talks about the, the idea that, that good ideas, great ideas flow through you. And I was watching clips actually of you yelling at me saying, Mark, why are you limiting? Because I think part of it's like maybe the ADHD that I have or like, or that I want to do everything or that I'm an idea machine. I've taught myself to limit my ideas. Like I've, I've, I've trained myself to go, that's a great idea. Uh, let's put that on the back burner. That's a great idea. Oh, I don't have time for that. That's great because it's just too many ideas coming at me. And so I was going back and looking at clips and realized you've been yelling at me for years about this. But just owning the fact that a good idea that comes to you, the fact that it came to you and it's an idea means that it's a great idea that you should run with. If it's smart, if it's helping people, if it serves you, all of those conditions applied, I think is the thing that most of us probably, and I'm glad you started the book there, but I think it's the thing that most of us probably struggle with the most. Because who am I? You know, who am I? And very egotistical and all of those things. Can you explain just a bit more about why your ideas are so genius and my ideas are so genius. And if you're listening to this, why the person listening's ideas are so genius. Yeah, I, I, I would just take out the word smart because it may not be smart. It may be the stupidest thing of all time. But what I want people to pay attention to is the energy state that you're in. So are you in a positive or negative energy state? Like if you're pissed off, somebody cut you off in traffic, you're, you're going to get a bunch of ideas. A You're gonna want to like. Ago, I was having a really, really, really bad day, and I felt terrible. And I was laying in bed, and I and I had some ideas like I should just stop doing everything. I should just give up. I should just like yeah. go do something else. And then I remembered like, hey, maybe I'm not in the best energy state to make these decisions. That that like chasing. We often make impulsive decisions negative when we're in a negative state of mind that then hurt us. And then we we have what restraint on the positive ones. And I want you to flip it. So if somebody cuts you off in traffic, and listen, I'm not perfect at this either, but it's like, a, it's an intention to try to get better at. If somebody cuts you off in traffic, it's not about honking at them, putting up your middle finger, catching up, driving fast next to them just to see what they look like. You know, what kind of terrible human <laughs> would cut me off? You know, what are they? I knew it. I knew they would look like that, right? Like these are not, you're not actually proud of yourself for doing these things, but we act on these negative impulses. You're not like getting cut off by somebody pissed off and said, I'm going to start a podcast. This is going to be amazing. I'm going <laughs> to, <laughs> right? So those ones have a little restraint on, but, but the other ones, when you're feeling bold, inspired, powerful, this is where, when you hit a new high, like what comes to you, the ideas that come to you when you're feeling bold, especially the right ones for you. So if you listen to this episode and you're inspired, cool. What's, what's on your heart right now? What's the idea that comes into your mind right now? Where are you missing momentum somewhere in your life? Cool. That's the thing that you should at least try. It doesn't have to be perfect. You may not do it for the next 10 years, but it's worth it to go off and try. And this advice came to me from uh, Gary V's life coach, Beth Handel. I did an IG live with her. And to the idea again of just let's go and let's create and let's see what happens. I used to be the kind of guy who would want to have everything planned out and perfect and scripted and you end up with a bad result. Gary V's life coach, Beth, wanted to come on the show and normally she does this whole questionnaire of things that she needs to know about you before she goes on and coaches anybody. And I said, yeah, just ask me that live. <laughs> I don't want to even know the questions. I don't want to fill anything out. Just ask me that live. It's like, oh, but it gets very vulnerable and personal and like and yeah, say, amazing. Uh, Good. I, I did therapy live on on camera i can yeah do i've done therapy you've done eft tapping i've done book channeling like let let's do it just whatever questions you have go and create and 
that was an amazing experience. But again, just saying yes to something without worrying about how it's going to work out. What I told her was, and this was like great ideas flow through me. This is such a gift, and I'm I'm work, I'm going to put this on my wall. So it's a huge deal for me. Um, we're talking about the difference between me and like a Gary. And I told her, I believe in the plan. I believe in the plan. If I keep doing videos, if I keep doing shows, if I keep writing the books, if I keep showing up, I believe in the plan. And that allows me to go. And every now and then, I don't believe in the plan anymore. Like what happens when you don't believe in the plan? Well, I create a new plan. You know, I have this little moment of self-doubt and insecurity. I did, okay, blah, 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 new plan, go. New plan, believe in the plan, back. Evan's back, let's go, we're creating. You know, I had that half hour or hour, it's not weeks of self-doubt and, and new plan and we're going. But what ends up happening when your plan doesn't, you don't believe in your plan anymore and you can't come up with a new plan. And I'm thinking and I'm struggling. Like, I don't know. I, I don't have a new plan. Like, I don't know what to do. I don't know where it's going. I don't know if it's going to work out. And I don't like sitting in that zone for too long. So if I'm in there for more than a couple hours, I would just tell myself, great things happen to me. Great things flow through me. No, great things happen to me. That as a coping mechanism, because I don't want to sit in the weight of the thing because I feel like it doesn't serve me sitting there longer when I can't come up with a new plan, I need to get out of this so that I can be creative again because the creativity doesn't come from having low self-confidence. So that would be my way out. Great things happen to me. And then I feel better. <laughs> and then I come up with a great idea. And she said, the difference between you and Gary and other like insane high achievers is you use great things happen to me as your last ditch resort coping mechanism to avoid falling into depression and anxiety and stress. They live in great things happen to me. So instead of believing in the plan, it's believing that great things happen to me at the top line. And that was the big mind explosion for me in the hour and a half or whatever we talked. And I'm still not there yet. You know, I'm still, I'm still working towards that, but that's the intention. When you know the problem, you can start to work towards solving it. Um, so yeah, believing that great things happen to me is not just a thing that solves me from going into depression or anxiety, but actually is the greatest gift of all that I need to make at the the center of who I am. And so that's my ongoing challenge. I love that. And I the only thing I would say, because I've noticed this from you and from other leaders I've been around, is once you're able to balance great things come to me and you've worked on judgment, not judging yourself, not fearing other people's judgment quite as much. When you have both of those things worked out, because the not judging your ideas or yourself allows you the freedom of saying great things come to me. And then the more that great things come to you, the further it proves to you that you can do these things without judgment. I think you need to work on both of those hand in hand. Well, I think one leads to the other. Like if you actually believe great things come to you, then when an idea about doing a book channeling thing comes up, like, well, great things come to me, so I'm going to do it. And then allows you to release a lot of the judgment and the and the barriers and the blocks because you actually, if you actually believe that great things come to you, great things happen to you, like you actually believe that, then if something is happening to you and a door opens, like, okay, I'm not going to judge it because great things happen to me. So it doesn't have to, this is why, like I just picked on the word smart because it doesn't have to be smart because it makes no sense. A lot of these things, the greatest things in your life will make no sense. Like, but, like writing, like spending a day to create a top 10 of why Kanye is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> And then yell at your friend, Mark. <laughs> yeah. They, like Mark's been at the center of a lot of, of great things in my life. I love it. I know you got to go in a minute, but final question for you. I have to ask. I love your artwork. I love your brand. I love the color of, of what you do. But I, I saw the cover a bunch of times. And then only when I was holding it, did I really analyze it and realize it's Evan riding a, <laughs> riding a meteor <laughs> through space, <laughs> crashing off of other meteors. What the heck is happening on this cover, man? This is great. This is a channeled cover. This is it. So I'm I'm meeting Kira in Arizona to talk about the book and finalize. And um, I never liked my covers. Like your one word, my first book with Penguin, I, I hated didn't like it. the cover. Way so corporate. Yeah, I hated it. And I didn't realize how little traditional publishers actually devote to cover design and like testing on viewers and readers. Like they don't do any of it. So my initial thought flying in, I asked Kira, uh, do you have Photoshop on your laptop? Because I didn't have it on mine. And I wanted to, I had a Vanessa Van Edwards image. I don't know if you know her books, but 
um, she's in the in the on the cover. It's her, and then there's like little arrows pointing at her with different messages. Uh, and so, what my initial concept was: let's take a picture of Evan, and then have little arrows, like uh, one that goes to my head that says "Big decisions with your heart and small ones with your head" or something like that. And like some of the key Evanisms, put them on the cover. And then here I said, okay, let's let's channel your book cover. Like, okay, cool. What so do I Matthew do? McConaughey suggested that it yeah, should be you. Yeah, exactly. Riding. This is this, <laughs> should be this you is riding. Matthew McConaughey inspired. This is it. And so we we went uh we were in Arizona at you know, at a hotel like in the lobby whatever and uh just closed my eyes and we prayed on it and she put her she put her hand on my uh like her left hand on my heart and her my back hand on like the my back and then as she did she did this little like press and then boom this idea i just saw this evan this it's like okay and i'm trying to write it i'm trying to write it down and like explain what i had just seen but there's cartoon evan riding a comet holding on by like a wonder woman uh what's the thing not a whip lasso, but like a lasso, a, a lasso. lasso. so this yeah. is the wonder woman lasso and I'm crashing into these different meteors of all the reasons why. So it's like, give up. I can't, not worthy, be perfect, self-doubt. And, and it was like left, right, left, center. And it was so visual. And I came out of that, I was like, I got it. Like type it up. <laughs> and I wrote it out and I sent it to my designer. And, um, and then even the back was like, not your usual praise and whatever. It's like, use this book to launch your business, write your book, begin a healthy habit. Like what you can use this book for. And it was like, it was the, again, not judging the, when you saw the first, when you saw the artwork come back to you, did you go? Yes. That's yeah, yeah, it. yeah. Pretty much. Pretty much. There were a couple of tweaks. Like the, we added more meteors, the text changed a little bit. I also was really struggling because I wanted the book to be called momentum. And the subtitle was the only thing you're missing is momentum, but it didn't feel right to have momentum and momentum in both the title and the subtitle. But the way so it now is here is shouting like, it as you write it Evan is saying, It's like, Oh my God, it works so perfect. So I had the per, like the the head idea of like I like the Vanessa Van Edwards one and like let's find our way to make our version of it, but um, this was a channeled cover, and it's very different than a normal business book or my other copies of different book and but whatever it's like, cool this is this is different, let's go. Hey.